Chapter 8, Ethical Egoism. Psychological egoism is a theory about human motivation. It tells us that our only motivation is to make ourselves better off. This is not an ethical view because it says nothing about what is right or wrong. But as we have seen, if psychological egoism is true, then there is little point in fashioning a morality that demands self-sacrifice. Morality does not demand the impossible. If psychological egoism were true, then all morality could possibly do is to ask that we look out for ourselves. This is precisely the advice of ethical egoism. Unlike the psychological version, ethical egoism really is a moral theory. It tells us about what we are morally required and forbidden to do. Specifically, it says that there is one ultimate moral duty, to improve your own well-being as best you can. Whenever you fail to achieve this goal, you are behaving immorally. Many ethical egoists have been psychological egoists as well, but this isn't required. You might reject psychological egoism and so think that we can be altruistic while denying that we should be directly concerned with the well-being of others. Ethical egoism gains support from psychological egoism, but this is not its only source of support. As we will see, there are several arguments for thinking that, surprisingly, ethics is all about getting ahead in the world and making ourselves as well off as we can be. Why be moral? Imagine that you are a stockbroker with inside information about an upcoming corporate takeover. Once the takeover is announced, the company's stock will soar. If you were to purchase a large amount of that stock right now, you'd stand to make millions. Should you do it? Suppose that you are seriously thinking about this. You've carefully calculated the chances of getting caught and have determined that the risk is small. Further, even if you are caught, the penalty is slight enough as to make the risk worth taking. Still, you are sure that such behavior is immoral. Brokers are able to gain privileged information only on the condition that they not take unfair advantage of it. You'd be doing just that. Yet, since the potential gain is so great, why let morality stand in the way? There are countless situations that pose the same problem. Imagine cheating on an exam to increase the chances of landing an excellent job, or lying to an investigator to avoid prosecution, or doing some creative bookkeeping to minimize a tax burden, or spreading nasty rumors in order to hurt a competitor. In a perfect world, virtue would always be rewarded and vice would never flourish. But what should we do here in our imperfect world when immorality promises great rewards? What to do when moral behavior is met with ridicule, a prison term, or a bullet? It is easy when morality and self-interest give the same advice, but what if they don't? If ethical egoism is true, there are no such cases. This sort of egoism claims that actions are morally right just because they best promote one's self-interest. On this view, conflicts between self-interest and morality are impossible because our fundamental moral duty is to maximize self-interest. If, among all of the options available to you, there is one that will serve you best, then that is the option that morality requires. It may seem that there is nothing ethical at all about such a theory. Consider this. If people can best improve their lot in life by secretly killing political opponents, stealing from the weak, or humiliating their employees, then ethical egoism imposes is a moral duty to do such things. But how could a plausible ethical theory do that? Indeed, it seems that we can use such examples to create a decisive anti-egoist argument, call it the argument from paradigm cases. 1. If an ethical theory requires killing, rape, or theft just because such actions maximize self-interest, then that theory cannot be true. 2. Ethical egoism sometimes requires such actions, just because they sometimes do maximize self-interest. 3. Therefore, ethical egoism cannot be true. A paradigm is a model, a very clear example. Some of the examples used in this argument are the clearest cases of immorality we can think of. The underlying thought here is that any ethical theory ought to classify these actions as immoral and explain why they are so obviously wrong. Ethical egoism fails to do that. Ethical egoists, henceforth just egoists, can offer two replies to this argument. They can reject its first premise, or they can reject the second. To reject the second premise, egoists must claim that killers, rapists, and thieves can never best advance their own interests by perpetrating such crimes. This claim could be true if there is a god who punishes these actions with eternal damnation. It could also be true if such acts deserve suffering and a doctrine of karma guaranteed that you eventually get what you deserve. 
But suppose that you don't find such accounts convincing. Are there other ways to defend the idea that those who kill, rape, and steal are never better off as a result? Plato thought he could do it. He tried to show that those who are unjust are always harmed because of their injustice. He spent a good part of the Republic arguing that all powerful tyrants, though able to control and acquire so much in this world, are still doomed to terrible lives. Even as they tell themselves how much fun they are having, they are inwardly miserable, constantly fearful and insecure, leading lives filled with anxiety and suspicion. Once we see what an immoral life is really like, we will realize that we are far better off being moral. Plato's argument depends heavily on his claims about the inner lives of immoral people. I think it fair to say that his case is not fully persuasive. Certainly, many immoral people are deeply troubled and unhappy, but others are able to sleep well at night, take pride in a job well done, assassination, theft, betrayal, and find friends within a network of like-minded associates. The bad guys sometimes get away with it, have a lot of fun in the meantime, and never regret the harm they have caused. Much more, of course, needs to be said about what is truly beneficial for us. Chapters 1 through 4 covered these issues, but they are hardly the final word on the matter. And since we don't have space here to discuss religious views of the afterlife, we have to admit that the jury is still out on the truth of premise 2. Perhaps it is false. Perhaps there is some very powerful argument that can show that wrongdoing will never maximize the self-interest of anyone. If that argument can be given, then we can strike down premise 2. And that, of course, would be great news for the egoist, since the fall of premise 2 would spell the defeat of the entire argument from paradigm cases. But let's assume for the moment that premise 2 is true, and that, as it seems, some immoral actions really do best promote the interests of those who commit them. If that is so, then egoists must take aim at premise 1 of the argument, and that, in fact, is precisely what they will do. Suppose that we will not always do best for ourselves by following the familiar laundry list of moral rules. Then conventional morality and self-interest will sometimes clash. When that is so, the egoist is forced to reject conventional morality. And since the first premise of the argument is just an expression of conventional morality, the argument begs the question against the egoist. Think about it this way. Only those who already dislike egoism would accept the first premise. Premise 1 is not a neutral claim. Rather, it assumes that egoism is mistaken. It assumes, specifically, that self-interest cannot morally justify actions such as rape and theft. True, such actions do seem to be paradigm cases of immorality, and so any moral theory that encouraged such actions would be suspect, but an egoist who accepts premise 2 will claim that our paradigms are mistaken and they might be. We can't absolutely rule out such a possibility. Still, we can recall Aristotle's advice recorded at the end of the previous chapter. We have reason to stick with the appearances and to take things at face value until we are given excellent reason for doubt. It seems that killing, rape, and theft are very clear cases of immorality, especially when they are done to serve self-interest. That is just what premise 1 says. Given how appealing the premise is, we are right to insist that egoists provide a compelling counter-argument, one that can reveal the error of our popular ways of thinking. Let's now consider two prominent attempts to do just that. Two popular arguments for ethical egoism. As we have just seen, ethical egoism can clash very radically with our deepest moral beliefs. This happens in three ways. First, egoism may require some actions that seem highly immoral. If promoting self-interest requires a knifing in the back, the betrayal of a friendship, or the illegal use of insider information, egoism insists that we do these things. Second, egoism may forbid us from doing some actions that seem clearly morally good. Egoists think that any action that involves a genuine self-sacrifice is immoral. Egoism insists that it is wrong to go out of your way to be kind, to keep your promises, or to care for your children if you pass up a chance at personal gain by doing so. Third, egoism may permit us to escape some very important moral duties. It seems, for instance, that we each have a duty of easy rescue. If saving someone comes at little or no cost to ourselves, then we must do what we can to help. Yet, if your interests are best served by ignoring such victims, then egoism frees you of any duty to help. Indeed, as a general matter, egoism requires that we help others only when we help ourselves in the bargain. The self-reliance argument. These claims require defense. Here is one that is worth considering, not because it succeeds, but because it is often urged with approval. Call it the self-reliance argument. 1. 
The most effective way of making everyone better off is for each person to mind his own business and tend only to his own needs. 2. We ought to take the most effective path to making everyone better off. 3. Therefore, we each ought to mind our own business and tend only to our own needs. There are two problems with this argument. Its first premise is false, and its second premise is one that egoists cannot accept. The first premise is false because those who are in need of help would not be better off if others were to neglect them. If you are suffering a heart attack and I know CPR and am the only one able to help, then you are definitely worse off, not better, if I decide to leave you alone and go on my way. Nor is complete self-reliance even a good general policy. It might be better if everyone were self-reliant than if everyone were constantly sticking their nose into other people's business, but these are surely not our only two two options. There is a middle path that allows a lot of room for self-interest, but also demands a degree of self-sacrifice, especially when we can offer great help to others at very little cost to ourselves. Everyone would be better off if people helped others to some extent, rather than if people offered help only when doing so served self-interest. Further, the argument's emphasis in premise two on our doing what will improve everyone's well-being is not something that the egoist can accept. For ethical egoists, the only ultimate moral duty is to maximize personal benefit. There is no moral requirement to make everyone better off. The egoist allows people to help others, or to have a care for the general good, but only when doing so will maximize their own self-interest, and not otherwise. The Libertarian Argument there is another popular argument for severely limiting our duties to others. Call this the libertarian argument. Libertarians claim that our moral duties to help other people have only two sources, consent and reparation. In other words, any duty to aid another person stems either from our voluntary agreeing to accept that duty, i.e. our consent, or from our having violated someone's rights and so owing a duty to repair the wrong we have done. But if I do not consent to help other people, and have done them no wrong, then I have no duty to help them. This is a fascinating argument. There is little controversy that our duties can originate as the libertarian suggests. The real question is whether there are sources of duties other than consent and reparation. In the example of offering easy rescue, for instance, it seems that the victim's needs, together with my ability to help at little cost, are enough to generate a duty that I help. Consent did not enter the picture. I was morally required to help, even if I didn't agree to do so. And I had done the victim no wrong, so reparation was not an issue. The libertarian will deny that someone else's needs, plus one's own ability to help, are enough to generate a moral duty of offering assistance. After all, if I need $10,000 for knee surgery, and you were a millionaire who could easily afford to pay for it, you are not automatically required to hand me the money. There is a lot one might say about the libertarian argument. Indeed, I think that it poses one of the most fundamental challenges in political philosophy. Yet, we can avoid a look into its details, because even if the argument is sound, it cannot support ethical egoism. The basic explanation for this is that egoists cannot accept the argument's central claim. Egoists deny that there are two ultimate sources of moral duty, consent and reparation. In fact, egoists deny that either of these is a source of moral duty. For them, self-interest is the only source of our moral duties. We must fulfill our voluntary agreements, or repair the damage we've done, only when doing so is in our best interest. When it is not, we have no moral duty. The libertarian argument tells us, for instance, that if we promise to volunteer at a local hospital or consent to the details of a home sale, then we should follow through. However, if doing so fails to make us better off, then egoism says that we have no duty to stick to our agreements. Indeed, egoism forbids us from holding up our end of the deal. Libertarians would require that we keep our word. Since egoism and libertarianism often give such conflicting advice, egoism cannot gain support from libertarianism. The Best Argument for Ethical Egoism Despite their popularity, the self-reliance and libertarian arguments fail to support ethical egoism. To locate a stronger foundation for the view, I think that we need to focus on one of the perennial questions in ethics and see how the egoist can answer it. It is here that egoism finds its strongest support. The perennial question is the one we began with. Why be moral? 
ethical egoism has a watertight answer to this question. We should always be moral because morality always serves self-interest. We all agree that there is good reason to look after ourselves. Since that is so, and since morality, as the egoist sees it, always advises us to protect our interests, there is always good reason to do as morality requires. We can mold this line of thought into a very powerful argument. Call this the best argument for ethical egoism. It starts with the common thought that every moral duty provides an excellent reason to obey it. And it then says that we have reason to do things only if there is something in it for us. It would be irrational, for instance, to sacrifice your own well-being if you got nothing in return for such sacrifice. When you put these two thoughts together, you arrive at the conclusion that whenever we are morally required to do something, doing it must promote self-interest. This is just what ethical egoists believe. Here's the argument in a nutshell. 1. If you are morally required to do something, then you have good reason to do it. 2. If there is good reason for you to do something, then doing it must make you better off. 3. Therefore, if you are morally required to do something, then doing it must make you better off. The argument is logically valid. Its two premises are each widely accepted, and on the face of it, they are highly plausible. Consider the first premise. If I am duty-bound to do something, don't I have some good reason to follow through? Perhaps this good reason isn't always decisive. There might sometimes be even better reasons that count against doing my duty. But at the very least, being morally required to, say, keep a promise or tell the truth is at least some reason to do such things. Now consider the second premise. It is hard to doubt that there are compelling reasons to protect your own interests. If some action promises me no gain but only loss, then what reason is there for me to do it? I'd be irrational to sacrifice my interests without the promise of some compensating benefit. It might be heroic to give up one's life for a stranger or to forfeit one's last chance at happiness so that others may enjoy life, but reason can't require such sacrifice. My own view is that the the best argument for ethical egoism is ultimately unpersuasive. I think that the first premise is true, but have come to doubt the second premise. Once we examine this theory of reasons with a little more care, it may be less plausible than a first look would suggest. We can begin to see this by considering two superficially similar claims. A. If an action makes you better off, then there is good reason for you to do it. B. If there is good reason for you to do an action, then doing it must make you better off. Claim A looks pretty good. It tells us that self-interest is always a good reason for doing something. It doesn't say that this is the only reason for acting, and it doesn't say that it is always the best reason. Though A is an extremely attractive claim, it is difficult to explain its plausibility. It seems to me just one of those rock-bottom assumptions we make about the kinds of reasons we have. If someone were to deny it, for instance, it isn't clear what we could say on its behalf. That doesn't show it to be implausible, not everything can be explained, it may be that A is more basic than any other claim we might use to defend it. This isn't the case for B, which should look familiar. It is the same claim as the best arguments premise 2, and it seems that there are many counterexamples to it. Cases of easy rescue provide the most compelling ones. If I see a terrible traffic accident occur and have a cell phone with me, I have reason to dial 911. I have that reason even if making the call will gain me nothing. If I see a window washer high up on a ladder and notice that my walking companion is about to accidentally bump into it, I have a reason to warn my friend and make sure that she avoids the ladder. I have that reason even if there is no benefit to me of doing so. Defenders of premise 2 cannot accept this, and that seems a strike against their view. We can allow that promoting self-interest is a good reason for doing things, but why is it, as they claim, the only good reason? I don't know of any compelling answer to this question. In the absence of such an answer, we have some basis for thinking that premise 2 is false. And if it is false, then the best argument for ethical egoism is unsound, since that argument relies on it. This does not by itself show that ethical egoism is false, but if we can combine the absence of a strong argument for ethical egoism with the presence of strong reasons to oppose it, then this does leave us with a powerful case against ethical egoism. Three Problems for Ethical Egoism The three most serious problems for ethical egoism are 1. That it violates some of the deepest and most central moral beliefs we have 
two, that it cannot allow for the existence of moral rights, and three, that it arbitrarily assigns self-interest complete priority over the interests of others. Egoism violates core moral beliefs. We have already mentioned the first criticism, and have allowed that it can't refute egoism all by itself. Still, if a theory deeply violates common sense, and if there is no compelling argument for that theory, then we are justified in rejecting it. Egoism does run strongly counter to common sense, since it imposes a moral duty to kill, rape, torture, or humiliate whenever doing so best serves self-interest. It allows us to ignore the vital interests of others, even if we can promote them at no cost to ourselves. And we have not seen a compelling argument for ethical egoism. Until we do, we are therefore right to trust our core moral beliefs and so reject egoism. Egoism cannot allow for the existence of moral rights. It isn't clear that egoism can make sense of moral rights. These are moral claims that give a person control over certain aspects of her life, even if it is to another person's advantage to ignore such moral claims. If I have a reason to be free of physical attack, for instance, then it is wrong of anyone else to beat me to a pulp, even if doing so somehow makes them better off. Egoists can offer no one a guarantee against this or any other sort of personal violation. Suppose that it is in your best interest to kill me, or to deny me freedom of speech, or to take what I own. If egoism is true, then you are morally permitted, indeed morally required, to do these things. And if you are morally allowed to do them, then it is hard to see how I could have a right that you not do such things. My right to life, or to free speech, is worthless if other people are allowed to kill me or shut me up whenever it serves their interests in doing so. Egoists can reply that they grant each person the right to pursue self-interest. This is true, in a way, but not in a way that offers us any protection. To see this, consider two things we might mean when we say that everyone has a right to pursue self-interest. A. All people are allowed to pursue self-interest. B. Each person is entitled to a certain amount of freedom from hostile behavior by others, and this means that everyone else has a duty not to interfere with a person's pursuit of self-interest. Egoists accept A. They can't accept B. Yet B is the only version that offers us protection against the actions of others. To see this, imagine a plot device that became familiar to me as a child. A surprising number of 1970s TV episodes imagined a warped villain who had some hapless victim at his mercy. The villain says to him, you are perfectly free to run, I'm not stopping you, so run. The victim is allowed to run. In this sense, he has a right to flee, but there is a catch. The villain is also allowed to hunt his victim and kill him if he can. The victim's right to run is basically worthless in such a situation. It offers him no protection at all. Now, back in the real world, suppose, as is often true, that your self-interest conflicts with mine. If egoism is true, then I have a duty to harm you, since that will benefit me. And you have a duty to harm me for the same reason. Even though we are each allowed to pursue our self-interest, egoism can't forbid other people from harming us if it is in their interest to do so. It grants us a right of the sort described in A, but that offers us no moral protection against interference from others. And such interference can be very terrible. It can even amount to killing, if killing is what would maximize someone else's interests. If egoism is correct, then our basic moral duty is to make ourselves as well off as possible. We may have to hurt others in order to fulfill that duty, and that means that morality will not protect them from such harm, nor will it protect us if the tables are turned. So the best that egoism can do here is to tell us that we are each free to pursue self-interest. It cannot offer us the sort of moral rights we really want, those that protect us from harm and from unwanted interference by others. Egoism arbitrarily makes my interests all important. Now we arrive at the deepest threat to ethical egoism. This theory tells us that we should give complete priority to the interests of a single person, oneself, over the interests of everyone else. If that were really so, then there would have to be some relevant difference that could justify this different treatment. 
But what could that be? My basic needs for food, shelter, physical security, good health, and so on are shared by nearly every human being. I am unique, of course, but then so is everyone else. I have my special talents, but again, so does everyone else. Ethical egoists need to explain why we are allowed to entirely discount the basic needs of others, even though these needs may be identical to our own. I think that egoists can, in fact, make a partial reply here. Suppose that my leg has been wounded in a hunting accident. I can still drive to the hospital and get it cared for. I know that doing so is going to cost me almost all of the money I have. Once I arrive at the hospital, I see another victim of a hunting accident with an injury very like my own. He is obviously poor, needs the surgery as badly as I do, but lacks the money to pay for it. Most of us agree that it would be acceptable if I used my money to pay for my own surgery rather than forego it and pay for his. But why? To make the case harder, assume that this other accident victim is as nice a guy as I am, is just as smart and community-minded as I am, and so on. Still, I am allowed to give myself preferential treatment here. Our cases appear alike, and yet common sense allows me to give myself priority over another person who is my equal in every relevant respect. Perhaps common sense is just mistaken in allowing people to give some priority to their own needs over those of others. If it is, then ethical egoism is certainly false, but suppose that common sense has it right so that in the hunting example, for instance, I am allowed to spend the money on myself rather than on a stranger. If so, then morality does grant individuals some extra consideration when determining their own fate. When things are equal, we are allowed to tip the scales in our favor. I do not know how to explain this. Like the claim that we have some reason to promote self-interest, this principle seems to be a basic axiom of any plausible ethical view. Yet even if we accept that people are morally allowed to give themselves some priority, that does not mean that they are allowed to give themselves complete priority over others. Ethical egoism claims that the interests of others considered in themselves count for nothing. We are to treat our interests as the only thing of importance. Ethical egoism tells us that even when the stakes are very high for others and very small for ourselves, we are entitled to ignore the needs, wants, and interests of those who are our equals in all relevant ways. Egoism completely denies the moral importance of other people or other things, such as the environment, except insofar as they can help us to benefit ourselves. That is a kind of deep bias that requires substantial defense. It isn't clear what that defense would be. Conclusion Ethical egoism tells us that morality is all about making myself, whoever I happen to be, better off. If egoism is true, then we have only one basic moral duty, to maximize self-interest, even if doing so means killing others, stealing from them, or framing them for crimes that we committed. If egoism is true, we have no direct duties to help others in need, even if offering such help costs us nothing. It is clear that for these reasons, egoism violates a number of our core moral beliefs. As such, egoists must offer really compelling arguments to get us to abandon those core beliefs and switch to the new ones that egoists prefer. Yet even the best argument for ethical egoism is not good enough. Until we are presented with a new argument for ethical egoism, we are right to be highly skeptical of its claims. If doubts about ethical egoism are on target, then morality does indeed place some intrinsic value on the interests of others. But how far should this be taken? Must we sacrifice everything for others, even for strangers? Or is there some middle ground, a principled way to balance our own needs with everyone else's? The next theory we consider, consequentialism, will begin the process of shifting the moral focus away from ourselves. As we'll see, consequentialists don't deny the value of self-interest. They just deny that your interests are any more valuable than anyone else's. This move to impartiality is very important in moral thinking. Let's see how far it can take us.